Hello, um, this is Christine O'Connor, and now we're going to do Atomic Absorption Spectroscopy, um, Part 2. So, um, this section I just want to look at the interferences that occur when using an AAS, and there's different types of interferences. So, the concentration of the analyte element is considered to be proportional to the ground state atom population in the flame. Any factor that affects the ground state atom population can be classified as an interference. Factors that may affect the ability of the instrument to read this parameter can also be classified as an interference. So the three common types of interference that we see in AAS are physical interference, chemical interference, and spectral interference. Physical interference. So this is where you are using a flame and the spray efficiency is fluctuating into the flame. So this might occur due to difference in viscosity and surface tension between the standard and the sample. If you're using a furnace, such as the graphite furnace, um, that we discussed in part one, the sample dispersion uh, may affect um, the measurement. So the measurement value fluctuates due to the sample dispersion, and this could be due to the tube temperature distribution. So remember, for a furnace, it's just that small little graphite tube where the sample is in inserted into. And viscosity is another problem with the graphite furnace. So you may have adherence uh, to the sample tip, causing errors in collection of quantity. And you also might have uh, different types of viscosity depending on your sample, such as blood or juice, um, and others containing other organic components. So <clears throat> chemical interferences then, these result from various chemical processes occurring during atomization that alter the absorption characteristics of the analyte. So the formation of compounds of low volatility reduces <clears throat> the rate at which the analyte is atomized and causes low results. Dissociation equilibria, for example, the line intensity of the sodium is increased by the presence of HCl, which is the hydrochloric acid. Um, generation of low boiling point um, compounds by coexisting matrices. So again, examples are the influence of chloride ions relative to cadmium in furnace analysis. So what happens is you get a generation of cadmium chloride. Other chemical interferences are the generation of non-separable compounds by coexisting matrices. So uh, examples of those are phosphates, sulfates, silicates, um, which are relative to calcium and magnesium in flame analysis. So again, you can get chemical interferences where the metal that you're analyzing, such as uh, calcium, can form calcium phosphate uh, during the analysis. Formation of compounds of low volatility reduces the rate of, in the presence of high concentrations of sulfate or phosphate. Aluminium causes low results in the determination of magnesium due to the formation of a heat stable aluminium magnesium compound. And we were talking about this formation of stable and non-stable compounds in our previous AAS lecture. Okay, so the solution then to resolving these chemical interferences, the first one is um, higher flame temperatures. So that is one solution to this problem. So use uh, a higher flame temperature um, than you were previously using. Adding releasing agents. So this is more commonly used. Um, so a releasing agent is a cation that reacts preferentially with an anion to release the analyte. 
the releasing agent should form a compound of higher stability than that formed by the analyte. And adding protective agents, so prevent interference by forming stable but volatile species with the analyte. Um, a protective agent is usually a ligand that reacts with the analyte, forming a relatively volatile complex. So an example here is the use of EDTA, um, and this can be added to protect the analyte cation. So again, if you're using calcium um, analysis, um, you can use EDTA as um, a protecting agent. Spectral interferences then. So the presence of combustion compounds or products, and they often exhibit a broadband absorption and can form particulate products that scatter radiation. The samples containing metal oxide particles, such as sodium oxide, magnesium oxide, calcium oxide, lithium oxide, and silver oxide, can also cause scattering of the instant beam. So a solution to spectral interferences is we have to correct these effects by making absorbance measurements of a blank solution to set our baseline. Um, also, when we're looking at spectral interferences, um, these can occur when the absorption or emission of an interfering species overlaps with the analyte absorption or emission. So again, you need to know what um, metals are going to absorb in, at the same wavelengths. So here we see aluminium is at 308 nanometers, and we have vanadium also at 308 nanometers. So if you thought both of those were in the same sample, you should avoid analyzing them together. The same with cadmium and arsenic, okay? And these would be in a lot of environmental samples in very trace amounts. So again, you just need to be aware of that. An easy way to get around this problem is just to choose a different wavelength that you can measure those methods at. Um, and why are we using AAS? Well, we're looking for this sensitivity um, where we can really do trace analysis and trace um, metal analysis. So atomic spectroscopy is a very sensitive technique for most elements. The concentrations are at parts per million level, and this may be routinely determined using flame atomization. Uh, using the electrothermal atomization or the graphite furnace, concentrations could go down as far as parts per billion. Um, so this is nanograms per litre and this is micrograms per litre. So just remember that if you want to get down to lower levels than the AAS, then you need to use the graphite furnace. The detection limit is the smallest amount of an element that can be readily measured, and this should be reproducible as well. It shouldn't be just a once-off measurement. You should be able to reproducibly measure um, at that level. So smaller limits of detection, uh, which are abbreviated to LODs, are better. Some common light metals have a lower LOD using flame AAS, most transition elements have a significantly lower LOD using AAS. So here we have uh, the limits of detection and we have um, the, the different elements. Solid samples then, how do we work with them? So solids are introduced in a variety of forms. We can have direct manual insertion uh, we can have use an arc or spark ablation, which uh, generates atoms of the solid. We can have laser ablation, which also vaporizes the sample to release the atoms. Or we can have sputtering, where you get neutral sample atoms are ejected when ions strike the solid surface under a high potential. Liquid samples 
Um, in order to obtain an atomic optical spectrum, we must convert our sample into gaseous um, atoms or ions. So the process of converting a sample to atomic vapor is called atomization, and we spoke about that yesterday. The heat will break all the bonds uh, given an atomic gas, and in atomic spectrum methods, solutions are introduced into the atomizer by means of a nebulizer. So just to uh, finally pull this together, the applications then of AAS. So there's lots of applications. Uh, water analysis is the, one of the most common ones, um, looking at uh, calcium, magnesium, iron, silica, aluminium content. Food analysis, so if you want to find out the iron content in cereals or in um, vegetables, you can use AAS. Analysis of animal feed stuff, and there's a huge amount of science going into this nowadays because it's um, the, the pet food industry is really growing and um, it's also to look at the nutrients that go into our animals also uh, for those, you know, it, it enhances their health and well-being. Um, analysis of additives in lubricating oils and greases. Um, again, we can do a whole series of uh, tests on that. Analysis of soil, so what are the nutrients in our soils? Um, and again, this is important, you know, for various reasons, environmental protection, agricultural reasons, and also if there was any um, suspected pollution or anything like that. Uh, clinical analysis then, um, blood samples, whole blood, plasma, serum, uh, urine samples, they can all be tested on AAS uh, for the various methods. Okay, so just in summary, what we covered in part two and in part one is we looked at AAS, AES and AFS. We spoke about the hollow cathode now. We talked about the atomizer of the AAS and the importance of the flame the flame temperature, the burner height, all of that. We also looked at the graphite furnace, AAS, and today we're after seeing that this goes down to even lower trace um, levels than the AAS on its own. So the graphite furnace goes down to parts per billion. We've looked at physical, chemical, and spectral interference effects that might happen when you're analyzing samples. We've also looked at the solutions to overcome them. We've looked at the sensitivity and detection limits of um, AAS. And again, just recapped on working with solids or liquids for this analysis. And I've just briefly mentioned um, some examples of the applications of AAS. So, um, that's all we're going to cover in AAS, um, and I hope that is clear. Thank you.